Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar titled PSYOPs Real World Dialogue, Advancing Patient Care Through Real World Data, Machine Learning, and Systems Biology. I'm Sydney Menson from the events team here at scientist.com, and I'll be your host for today. This webinar has been sponsored by PSYOPs, so a huge thank you to them for helping to make this webinar possible. We're very fortunate to have two speakers joining us today. First up, we have Dr. Nitin Baliga, Director of the Institute for Systems Biology. We also have Dr. Thomas Brown, Chief Medical Officer at PSYAPS. And with that, I'd like to welcome our speakers, Nitin and Tom. Thanks so much for being here today. Please take it away whenever you're ready. Sydney, uh, thank you. And again, welcome to all of you to this uh, PSYAPS Rural World Dialogue. Advancing Patient Care Through Real-World Data, Machine Learning, and Systems Biology. It's my great pleasure to have as our guest today a colleague and friend, Dr. Nitin Baliga. Uh, Dr. Baliga is a professor at the Institute for Systems Biology, where he is one of the founding members and currently serves as the Director and Senior Vice President at ISB. Uh, Nitin leads a cross-disciplinary team of scientists to address complex problems relevant to global health, personalized medicine, energy, and the environment. His team uses a systems approach that we'll talk about to construct predictive models of cellular and molecular networks within pathogens, cancer cells, and environmental uh, microbes. Uh, Dr. Baliga's research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, by the National Institutes of Health, NASA, Department of Energy, and the Department of Defense, again, showing that wide expanse of relevance. He's the senior editor of BMC Systems Biology and serves on scientific advisory boards of numerous academic and industrial organizations. I should note that Nitin is a member of our inaugural scientific advisory board at SIAPS. And lastly, a passion of Dr. Baliga's. He is also actively engaged in bringing an innovative inquiry-based curriculum on current science concepts to high schools throughout the United States. And in fact, has received the Alvin J. Thompson Award in recognition of his contributions to education. So Nitin, uh, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to uh, to have you and to discuss this um, notably uh, wide ranging but uh, timely topic of the application of real world data and big data. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. Uh, likewise, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. As you and I uh, know, and as we've recently discussed, um, Again, a, a wide ranging topic um, and one where many terms are thrown about. And it's always helpful to maybe start out framing some of those terms, some of those definitions. And the most obvious pair to talk about is that of real world data uh, as well as big data. In, in clinical medicine and clinical research, we think of real world data as being everything outside of clinical trials, but Give us your take on RWD and big data and the difference between the two. Uh, that's, that's a great place to start. Um, now I'll start with uh, defining big data uh, because that uh, includes everything, including real world data. So the term big data, it's not exactly clear when, when the term was originally coined, but it has been used to describe the universe of extremely large amounts of data and and when i say data this is big data refers to digital data that can be compiled in a manner that can be computationally mined for insights based on patterns and uh, and associations and so on and it's good to kind of get a sense of how big this data universe is and how fast it's growing so in in 2005 the size of the uh, data universe was about 130 exabytes. So to give you a sense of what an exabyte is, that's equivalent to 1 billion gigabytes. Uh, let's put that into perspective. So a high definition movie is about two gigabytes. Okay. So in 2005, we had 130 exabytes of total uh, data universe size. 
and the International Data Corporation made some projections that by 2020, we would have about 40,000 exabytes of data. Okay, but turns out in 2021, just in 2021, we generated about 80,000 exabytes of data. And put that into perspective, that's assigning 10,000 gigabytes of data to each individual on this planet. So it's incredibly large amounts of data. Uh, and these have been used and mined effectively by a lot of companies. I mean, you know, you're told what next appliance to buy or what book to read next, et cetera. Those are all based on mining patterns of you know, purchases and usage of appliances and so on. Now let's look at uh, real world data, which is in a way a subset of the big data universe. So there's a definition by the FDA for big data and they refer to it as the data that is related to patient health status and or delivery of healthcare routinely. Um, and these data are collected from a variety of different sources. They can include things like electronic health records, uh, claims and billing activities, product and disease registries. And there's also molecular profiling information that is growing at, at a very fast pace. So, so one thing to know is the, the, there's three Vs they say for big data that apply to real world data. One is variety, there's the different kinds of data that you can generate. There's volume, large amounts of data, and velocity is the pace at which the data are generated. So I think that should give you a rough idea of what we mean when we say big data or real world data. Boy, Nitin, I'm, I'm so taken with your comments about the scale of big data. One question that comes to mind in listening to you is uh, you've emphasized the growth, the rapid growth and the accumulation of data. Are there issues in terms of preservation of data as, as time passes, uh, effectively having a comprehensive uh, library of data as it, as it accumulates? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of key aspects to making data useful. One is making sure you capture the metadata information, how it was collected, uh, and with what technologies, how it was processed, if it has been gone through some, some pipelines, uh, archiving it in a way that is accessible, that is secure. Privacy is a big issue when it comes to big data. Um, the need for standard vocabulary of data. So when you preserve it, you preserve it in a way that can still be interpreted for, for the long run. So now data is only as useful as uh, how it has been, how it has captured the essence of what it, information it contains. And, and uh, I want to move on to another key definition, but before that, Nitin, with regard to your comments about standardization, harmonization, how far along are we uh, in terms of standards being recognized for how data is archived? It's getting better, but I think we're really far from having uh, data from different sources be in alignment in terms of the use of vocabulary and uh, formats and, and so on. Um, and, and we may get to this later on. Joining data is a really key step in being able to combine information from different sources, also the same kind of data from multiple sources. And with the absence of standardization, as I mentioned earlier, those data are largely not usable. And especially when it comes to electronic health records. Um, there's a whole different challenge of taking, taking notes and using character recognition and natural language processing and converting that into digital format. Mining literature also uh, has to be done in a way where context is preserved. Um, so in the end, when you look at these data for the same type of measurement, you have a variety of different formats. So oftentimes, at least when we work with these uh, big data sets, we spend an enormous amount of time in harmonizing them. And, and there are standards that have been proposed, but the thing with standards uh, is that people say there are too many standards. Um, and then slowly as the funding agencies like NIH and journals start agreeing about 
common data standards. Um, I think we won't make big headway, but that is changing. I think more and more people are recognizing the importance of, of uh, standard vocabularies and formats and interoperability and so on. So things are getting better, but there's a lot of legacy data that still needs to be uh, combined, curated, archived and made accessible in a, in a easy to access ma manner. So Nitin, that's probably a, a terrific segue, you know, the, the concept of needing to connect bits of information, in some cases, large bits of information. Good segue into having you help us with the definition of systems biology. Uh, and of course, you're a, a leader at uh, the Institute for Systems Biology. What, how would you frame systems biology for our audience today? Yeah, so let me begin with an analogy. Uh, I'll just, just define systems biology at a high level as a discipline uh, of biology to understand complex behaviors and phenotypes of living systems or organisms. But I'll, I'll use an analogy to tell you, you know, why systems thinking and systems approaches is, is necessary. And then maybe I'll, I'll go a little bit into what entails a systems biology approach. Um, so uh, let's take an airplane as an example of a complex system. You know, a, a hallmark of a complex system is it's made up of many parts. So in an airplane, you have the landing gear, you have wings, you have the rudders, you have the fuselage. Now you can take a look at any of those individual parts and you won't be able to um, understand the emergent property of flight or the properties of aerodynamics. You need to understand how those parts are wired together and how they interoperate dynamically to give this whole machine this property of flight. And then you can simulate aerodynamics and all those different properties. Biological systems are not different from that concept. So biological systems, uh, let's take the human system, for example, we're made up of many, many parts. So in our genome, which is 6 billion base pairs, you have about 60,000 genes of which about 20,000 are believed to be protein encoding. And that's the genome equivalent in nearly all cells, except a few, maybe platelets in RBC and red blood cells as exceptions. Um, every other cell in our human body, there's about 200 different cell types, has the same genome equivalent. But the genes that are expressed within any cell type, and there's 200 different cell types, those genes are a little different in each cell type. And we made up of about 30 trillion cells, and then you have the whole microbiome component of about 30 uh, uh, trillion different microbes that live with us as commensals. That's the complexity of the human system. And there's you know, remarkably, uh, we, you know, we are mostly normal in that you know, systems are operating as expected, but when things go awry, that's when you get disease. Understanding the, the etiology of disease requires to take into account all of this complexity. So you need to know how these genes function in what context, which, with which other genes and so on. That's what systems biology does. So we enumerate all the parts, we look at how they're wired, we look at the dynamic interoperation and so on. And the way we do it is, is with an approach we call the systems biology approach. And I put a little graphic, uh, animated graphic here to help um, you and the audience uh, walk through this, this approach. So the systems biology approach begins with the idea that for every phenomenon, biological phenomenon, based on our current knowledge, we can formulate a hypothesis and a question. And based on that question, we can then determine what are the different parts that need to be interrogated and whether we have the right technologies to interrogate those parts, not just the parts, but all the other parts that are interconnected with, the, with that part. And oftentimes you find that that requires new technologies. So an essence of systems biology is the advancement of new technologies for measurements. And now we, you know, and, and the exciting thing is we are beginning to go down to single cell resolution in terms of what these technologies can do. But what happens when you apply new technologies is you get vast amounts of new kinds of data. And to analyze those data, we then have to invent new computational and statistical and mathematical tools. So we can then understand the information contained in those data, build predictive models and use those models to generate um, new hypotheses and see if our understanding 
fits with our original hypothesis. So this iterative aspect of systems biology drives our understanding towards mechanistic detail. And with each iteration, we are able to generate new insights, new technologies, and, and new software capabilities. And those go on to revolutionize all aspects of, of biology. So Institute for Systems Biology pioneered this approach. We were the founding institution that came up with the systems biology approach. It's interesting that in, in listening to you, the, the complexities of, say, systems at the cellular level are nicely understood by, by your comments. But inherently, this has to be an interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary effort, right, based on what you're describing, even beyond that's science, I would argue. That's absolutely right, Tom. And I think one of the key things that had to be disrupted was the culture of science. Um, you know, we are trained as um, siloed thinkers. So, you know, we're trained in biology, we're trained in chemistry, we're trained in physics, and we're made to believe that, you know, the, there are problems that reside within those silos. But when you actually solve a problem, especially a systems biology problem, you realize that you have to cross those disciplinary boundaries and learn to communicate with people who have other training backgrounds. And so one of the things that we do at ISP is we take pride in our culture of uh, cross-disciplinary science, where, where everybody has the, uh, um, is humble enough to know that there's someone else in the room who probably knows something more about the topic than they do. So that level of mutual respect and the ability to work with each other is, is essential to taking on this big complex problem. So you're absolutely right. It, it, it's a new era of cross-disciplinary science. And then connect for us, if you will, uh, the concepts behind computational biology and what you've talked about to date big data, real world data, systems biology? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things that uh, is absolutely necessary is computational tools to interrogate the vast amounts of big data. And one of the, the approaches people have taken, a very powerful approach is to use correlations between different measurements uh, across disparate data types to draw actionable insights. And this is immensely powerful. And I gave you a few examples earlier in terms of how, based on correlation, you can figure out uh, you know, what the likes of a certain person might be and how you can use that information to guide them towards uh, the next action. So you can make pre somewhat predictive um, inferences based on correlation. But the correlation, while powerful, and I'll, I'll give you some examples later on, that for diagnostics, Correlation can go a really long way. So even if you know just the what, meaning some change in some biomarker in blood may be predictive of some disease or indicative of some disease, it may be far removed from the actual cause uh, and mechanistic driver of the disease. So in a sense, you know, this whole approach of correlation is powerful, but it can sometimes be misleading. And there's a great article in the New York Times that was uh, published you know, about, uh, about eight years ago that I would highly recommend you go and take a look at. And it tells you that you know, while big data is powerful and the correlation-based approach is powerful, as the size of the data universe increases, and I told you earlier, it's growing into immense um, amounts of data, the chance of finding spurious correlations is also greatly increased. And this can really be misleading. And uh, one good way to appreciate that is with a few examples. So here I'm, I'm taking real world data. And for example, uh, these data sets come from the Centers for Disease Control and the National Vital Statistics Report. And as I mentioned earlier, joining data is really important to be able to interpret information across data sets. And from these data sets, if you were to apply a simple correlation-based approach, you would infer that people who drown after falling out of a, a fishing boat is because of marriage rate in Kentucky. And I mean, and in, in this case, you know what the two 
teachers are, and you know this makes absolutely no sense. And there's many, many examples like this, and there's a great website by Tyler Wyken that lists these kinds of correlations. And here you see Age of Miss America is correlated with murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. And I'll give you one more example, which shows that per capita cheese consumption is highly correlated with number of people who died by becoming entangled in their bed sheets. And there's absolutely no causality or mechanism behind these correlations. I mean, in this case, we, we can laugh that, you know, because we know what they, these features mean. But when you look at biomedical data, when you look at genes and metabolites and proteins, and you have very cryptic uh, features that are being correlated. And inferring information from those correlations becomes extremely difficult. And oftentimes it can send you down a rabbit hole chasing something that is meaningless. So one cautionary note to using machine learning and AI-based approaches is to know that while correlation is powerful, you have to be careful in what you use it for. And, and oftentimes when it comes to drug discovery or personalizing medicine or repurposing drugs, you need to go beyond correlation and you need to get to causation and mechanism. You know, and it's, and it's interesting in listening to your comments, you know, the importance of distinguishing between associations and causality. I mean, as a clinical investigator, we we have always struggled with that. You make an observation in a clinical trial and often it's simply an association, but without causality as to the intervention you're using in that clinical trial. I think the challenge is that with uh, big data, there's just a greater opportunity to take that uh, errant path, right? Uh, it's easier to come up with these associations because of the scale of things. Um, it would seem that way, at least. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and, and I think it happens a lot now. In the past, reviewers of uh, uh, science, scientific uh, uh, manuscripts weren't as savvy, but now I think more and more people have recognized that, you know, because the data are so vast, you can find evidence for any hypothesis. So you need to do something called multiple hypothesis testing. And you need to, when you do machine learning and um, AI-based pattern detection, you need to set it up in a way that you have training and test data sets. And it has to be demonstrated uh, in a statistically rigorous way that your models are not overfit to data, that they do retain the type of predictive power you would need when you apply it on new data, especially when it comes from new patients, the stakes are really high. So you, you have to be extremely cautious in making sure that these models are based in uh, a deep understanding of both the predictive power and when necessary, the basis of correlations or causality it is captured within the model. So this is a good springboard to go on to, I think, with one of the central aspects of our conversation today. And that is from your perspective uh, to date, where has systems biology to include computational bio biology tools, uh, where, where has there been the greatest impact to date? And where do you see the, the near future uh, significant impacts of systems biology? And there's at so many different levels that uh, big data and computational biology have had huge impact. Um, um, I'll start with this having the genome sequence and being able to mine, not just our genome sequence, but genome sequences of the thousands of different species. Now, CRISPR is a great example of a discovery that was made through comparative genomics originally that and they saw these interspersed repeats in bacterial genomes and didn't know what it meant. They had these viral pieces of viral genomes in there. And then uh, you know, um, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier figured out that this is actually a bacterial immune system, which was then leveraged by them and Feng Zhang and George Church and others to figure out ways to precisely manipulate um, human and other types of cells. And it's now being used for cell-based therapy, right? To, for CRISP, uh, for CAR-T 
cell-based therapies, you can precisely uh, generate the new antigen specific receptors and so on. Also discovery of multi-gene biomarkers has been, has exploded in giving us the capability of the accurate disease stratification or even early detection of certain diseases. Um, finding things like HER2 for uh, Herceptin responders is a great example. Finding the V600E mutation for responders to BRAF inhibitors is another good example. Uh, if, if I were to summarize this, what I would say is, if you were to look at randomized clinical trials, um, the way it was done previously, well, still being done that way, the success rate for oncology is a dismal uh, 2% or less. Okay, the reason behind that is patients are so different. We, you know, cancer is a heterogeneous disease, and you really need to understand what are the, the molecular features and the, the mechanistic drivers of an individual patient's cancer. And that kind of knowledge can be derived based on biomarkers, which could be mutations or uh, some patterns in, in, in blood proteins and so on. And having that kind of information allows you to improve the success rate of clinical trials by up to sevenfold. And because you can recruit the right kind of, kinds of patients for the right kinds of therapies. So there have there been a lot of examples of this already, of using biomarker enriched or stratified trials where you, your response rates can be really low. So you can get fewer patients and yet get uh, enough evidence of, of response. For example, if you had a 20% response rate, you would need 100 patients. But if you had a response rate of 80%, you would need just eight patients. So, so there's dramatic uh, implications for, for doing these smart trials, if you will. So with that, uh, Nitin, I thought we would surprise the audience. I don't know that uh, we underscored this dimension of our talk today, but we have a few uh, polling questions. Um, and the first one is, uh, how are you currently using or considering using uh, real world data? Uh, and if the audience could respond, um, we'll talk a little bit more and, and then um, look at the results. Uh, so Nitin, uh, you know, it's interesting as I was thinking of this aspect of our conversation today, uh, I kept going back to the Human Genome Project, which has has at least some elements of, for sure, of what we're talking about in terms of uh, big data and even some aspects of systems biology. And, and of course, uh, Dr. Lee Hood, uh, one of the central founders of ISB uh, was a, a, a key figure in uh, in the uh, genomic revolution in terms of sequencing uh, and uh, synthesizing both um, DNA and proteins. What are, what are your reflections on uh, in the context of our discussion today on the Human Genome Project and its impact on where we are today? I mean, that's I guess sort of a rhetorical question, but uh, the, the implications have been profound. I think, you know, I was actually a graduate student when the human genome was being sequenced. And, you know, I was, my research at the time was focused on understanding, you know, maybe five genes and how they were controlled in an extremophile, uh, an organism that lives in high salt conditions. And I got to know Lee Hurd at the time because we sequenced the genome of that organism. And we collaborated with Lee to do that. And I came to the realization that the four genes I, or five genes I was studying were five out of 2,400 genes in that one micro, right? And, and in reality, the micro was not just putting these five genes in a compartment to carry on that function. It was really interoperating these genes with all the genes in the genome. And then I took a look at the complexity of the human genome, which was just finished uh, in, in the, the late 90s to 2000 and came to realize that you know, we have barely scratched the surface of complexity in understanding some of these diseases like cancers. And the human genome really took the covers off and it showed us that there's a lot more information that we, we weren't aware of that needed to be considered. And since then, 
I think the whole culture of science has changed. And I touched on that a little bit earlier. And now every other week you get some new technology that can measure a new property of, uh, of human cells or, or bio biology in general. And we realize that there's so many layers of information processing and, and at each of those layers, you can have dysfunction that can lead to disease, right? And based on that understanding, we, we are now able to tailor therapies like uh, even glioblastoma, which is not a, a disease for which there has been a lot of progress. We came to the realization that patients who have methylation of a promoter of a gene called MGMT respond better to a drug called pemazolamide, right? That type of knowledge would not be possible without having the capability of detecting methylation of that gene, which is a technology that we can apply to all genes in the genome. Same with mutations. We would never know that certain mutations increase or decrease your propensity to get a disease or to respond to a therapy. And I've given a few examples of that, but I think the way we're thinking of biology is very different now. We think of it as an information science. And that has attracted engineers and mathematicians and statisticians to work on problems that impact all of us. And these new perspectives this, are go on, go on. Sorry. No, I, I was just going to pick up on your on your thread of logic there because it really does lead us into a subject that I wanted to have you comment on for the audience, and that is uh, the application of systems biology thinking, systems thinking to the practice of medis medicine. And in particular, the, the concept of what you and your colleagues refer to as P4 medicine. Would you talk a little bit about P4 medicine for our audience today? Absolutely. And, um, you know, let me, let me jump to, again, a little animation here to to walk you through this. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, all in a, a disease like cancer is a good example. You know, even the same type of cancer can be caused by dysfunction in a variety of different genes and at different levels of information processing. And knowing exactly what is the cause or driver of a disease can have profound implications on, on your decision to choose a treatment care plan. For, for a patient. And so one of the first things that you need to really understand for, for a disease is to figure out you know, what defines the healthy state and what defines a disease state and do that in a quantitative way. So in the past, we would go symptomatically, but now we can do molecular measurements. And as I mentioned earlier, we can do a variety of different kinds of measurements. And then in this case, you can use machine learning and AI to find out patterns that differentiate individuals that are healthy from individuals who have the disease. And you can use that as a diagnostic um, you know, set of biomarkers to accurately call the disease in a patient and stratify it precisely. And for, for many diseases, good stratification amounts to good treatment plan and uh, selection of therapies. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is can be done purely correlation-based. So these biomarkers may have nothing to do with the disease itself. But this is the, the part, of, I would say, is the, the predictive and personalized part. So you can identify for each patient what is unique to them. But if you want to be predictive of a future transition to a disease, then you need to understand a little bit more about uh, signatures that manifest in healthy individuals that are predictive of a future indication. So for that, you would, you would need a little bit more than correlation. Having causation really helps, so you can then detect that changes in certain gene networks are being detected in an individual that is increasing their risk of transitioning to a disease state. Okay? You can still do this by correlation, but the benefit of knowing the cause and mechanism is that you could find ways of preventing the transition. So that's the preventative part of P4 medicine. And you can find either, sorry, you had a question, Tom? No, I was just gonna comment, Nitin. I, and before we switch over to your uh, relevant slide, we, we can also comment on the survey results. But before I comment on the survey results, the, you know, the interesting aspect of what you're talking about of P4 medicine is in some ways, 
I, I like to say, attempting to redefine illness in the sense of illness being the risk of illness, uh, moving upstream, not only to earlier stage identification, earlier stage disease identification, but identifying individuals, populations at risk and intervening to prevent disease. And I've always thought that, I, you know, you and Lee and I have talked about this on occasion, that it's at some point in the not too distant future, we'll think of illness more in the context of risk of illness and intervening to address that risk, which is inherent in what you're describing, right? That's exactly right. And, and, and I think you alluded to this early detection sometimes amounts to total prevention. And, and we have examples of that in uh, colon cancer or prostate cancer or breast cancer and so on, is early detection can really save you a lot of complexity later on. Uh, in, in a disease like multiple myeloma, for example, um, if you catch a disease early when it's in what is called uh, mon monoclonal gammopathy uh, of un undetermined consequence, or smoldering myeloma. These are stages when you don't see symptoms necessarily, but beyond this, the disease starts becoming very heterogeneous. It, you know, you have hypermethylation, you have uh, amplification and deletion of chromosome arms, gain of somatic mutation, and the disease becomes quite complex, becomes very difficult to treat later on. So the question is, can we, for all these diseases, figure out early detection markers there are companies that are now looking in blood for uh, circulating tumor uh, DNA or and things like that to see if we can detect cancer at a very early stage. So for all of these reasons, I think being able to have sensitive measurements and good biomarkers that are predictive will go a long way towards prevention of disease. But one thing to also keep in mind is uh, oftentimes, you have to intervene in ways that are yet to be discovered. Right? Just did diagnostics exactly. is not in. So, so we need to figure out how to not just find the predictive markers, but also the causal and mechanistic drivers so we can drive drug discovery. And, and we can talk about personalized medicine in a second. There's an aspect of this that uh, is about the technology being ahead of the application uh, in many ways when it comes to healthcare. I want to make note of our polling here, as, as everyone can see. Uh, how are you currently using or considering using real world data? Clinical trial design and recruitment was the most frequently uh, mentioned, as well as uh, post market observational studies and clinical development. With that, um, Nitin, do you want to go on to the slide? I think you regarding P4 medicine. Yeah. Um, so I was going to. I mean, is this the slide that we were going to? I don't know if I had pushed it and people got to see this, but so I don't know, Tom. Did, did I go through this animation earlier, or? Uh, Yes, you did. Excuse me. Um, yeah, but, but there are a few points I do want to make just to close off the thought. I think the, the thing I was um, mentioning in terms of uh, personalizing medicine is knowing exactly what are the mechanistic drivers can allow you to identify the specific gene networks that are associated and the vulnerabilities in those networks that can serve as drug targets. And so this is a huge aspect of driving drug discovery, but the way drug discovery has been done. Nitin, has... I, I want to call out that actually you had not uh, shown the uh, P4 slide. You had shown the systems biology. Um, oh, I okay. think when maybe you were talking to it, you didn't have it pushed out to the audience. Do you want to show them that real quick? Absolutely, yeah. Because I think it underscores some of the points that you were making. Yeah, so no, I, I had mentioned earlier that the, the key aspect of P4 medicine is being able to accurately stratify disease. And we've done that in the past symptomatically, but now we can do it with molecular measurements. Uh, and these are a variety of different kinds of molecular measurements, which we referred to earlier as big data or real world data. And 
you can use machine learning and AI to find these patterns that are diagnostic of disease states. And so you can find differences in, in certain biomarkers when a person is healthy versus uh, when an individual has the disease. And this is what people refer to as uh, biomarkers or biomarker panels, and that have been used quite effectively in uh, diagnosing and stratifying disease. But to, to really get at uh, being able to prevent the transition of an individual from a healthy state to a disease state, you need to have dynamic understanding of early signatures of uh, a shift towards a disease state. And having that insight can allow you to be predictive. But if you can use biomarkers that are not just predictive, but are also causally and mechanistically associated with the disease trajectory, then you can find drugs that can be used to target the specific networks that are driving that patient's disease to block them, to block the transition. And eventually you can even reverse a disease state by understanding exactly what is the nature of the disease progression and what are the networks that are dysfunctional so you can appropriately tailor a treatment regimen that can target tumor cells in an individual patient in a personalized manner. And the participatory part here comes from patients themselves participating and contributing to this whole uh, approach. And the way they can do that is by self-reporting things like their weight, their diet, um, the, the medicines they're taking using wearable devices that can do you know, real-time monitoring of health metrics, et cetera. So P4 Medicine really brings together a lot of interconnected ideas to bring us to a new age of medicine where we are quantitative, we, are, um, we can prevent transitions, and we can also um, reduce healthcare costs by being proactive in taking action well before a person transitions into a disease state. And Nitin, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that um, at least aspects of P4 medicine are being integrated into some uh, medical school uh, curricula. Is that correct? That is true. I think the although I think we, we are at very early stages of that. And one of the things that is absolutely necessary is to train physicians in using this type of information. We, you know, the field of science has moved really fast in, in generating big data, mining data for insights. But what hasn't moved as fast is the translation of those insights into benefits for patients. And there's a whole ecosystem that has to shift in the way it operates. And one of the key aspects is physician training. Is physicians are not trained in thinking in a, at a systems level about disease and in being able to take vast amounts of information that exists out there and bring it in the context of an individual patient. They can, given their tight schedules and you know, the short amounts of time they have to see patients. So one is physician training. We can talk later about other changes that need to happen in the ecosystem to help them take advantage of uh, big data, machine learning, AI, and P4 medicine. Now, th these are all uh, obviously important for uh, the near-term uh, future generation of uh, medicine practitioners. I, I wanted to uh, go to another subject that you and I know is, is uh, critically important, and that is that no matter how high quality a data set is, uh, by definition, it's going to have certain internal biases, right, in terms of how the data was collected, how it was transformed through various transitions, harmonization, standardization. Can, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, internal biases in data sets and the importance of recognizing those uh, since they're omnipresent, right, in one form or another? Yeah, that, that's a really, really good question. Um, there's technical biases in data, which is something we call batch effects. So there have been studies that have shown that if you take data sets from different laboratories on uh, data sets regarding the uh, same type of information, hold on, uh, 
and you you run analysis to to get uh, insights from those data. The biggest insight you get is who generated the data. That's the biggest contributor to variance across the data sets, and th that would be considered platform bias or technology bias. Um, and one of the first things we always do when we join data sets from different sources or different groups is we do what is called batch correction. If you don't do batch correction, the, the signal coming from, as I mentioned earlier, who generated the data swamps some of the really meaningful signatures uh, because it masks that information. The second type of challenge uh, with big data um, has to do with the composition of the data itself. And this is not technical bias. This is compositional bias, for example, with regard to demographics of patients who were considered uh, for a particular trial. And uh, the TCGA, for example, there was a study done that showed that majority of patients, over 70% of patient, patients are of uh, uh, Caucasian background. And if you look at uh, African-Americans or Asians or um, uh, indigenous groups, they are highly underrepresented. And what that does is that it prevents you from detecting group-specific actionable genetic variation. So if you have variation that's under 5% in a group-specific way, you won't detect it for any of the, the minority groups in that, in that data set. And this has got, as you, as you might imagine, a feed forward effect on uh, which patients benefit who are recruited to trials and that perpetuates over time. So there are a lot and, of- And the relevance that, and the, the relevance of ultimate discoveries, right? To the broader population. It's, it's interesting, Nitin, because this phenomena, as you well know, is a, a real challenge in classical prospective uh, randomized clinical trials where not only is the participation in the U.S. relatively low across the board, but uh, underserved populations by definition are poorly represented so that the subsequent results arguably aren't quite as relevant as one would hope to the broader population. Yeah, and uh, you know, there are efforts now to address that, and we can talk about that as well. But, but we are far from... Uh, now, the, the place where we need to be in terms of having an equitable approach that, that impacts everyone equally. You know, Nitin, I, you and I have talked about this, but I wanted to bring up for the audience a recent experience that we've had at SIAPS. From uh, last year, we published uh, some work on our mortality score approach, where we gather information relating to uh, whether a, a subject is alive or not in the larger data set. And that mortality data can come from various sources, the Social Security Death Index, from digitized obituaries, uh, from SEER data, from the EMR. Um, and we created a hierarchy of truth, and we found that with this approach, there was a high sensitivity and high specificity in terms of accurately discerning whether a given subject was alive or not. And obviously, that's fundamental to any kind of survival analysis uh, or progression-free survival analysis for that matter. Uh, what was fascinating though in this article published in JCOCCI is that one of the findings was that there were internal uh, data biases uh, that in some ways translated into healthcare disparities. If you were relying solely on digitized obituaries, uh, patients of color were less likely to be accurately represented as to whether they were alive or not. Uh, and this it, that really grabbed our attention, and it was a highly referenced article because it underscores how uh, the real-world data you collect uh, needs to indeed be representative of the expanse of the real world. And one has to be mindful that certain uh, sources of data with no you know, intention uh, attached uh, tend to have you know, striking internal biases. Yeah, man, I think uh, this is becoming a well-known problem now. And um, 
you know, if you if you apply for funding from places like NIH, um, they make an explicit requirement that you consider the uh, composition of uh, patients, even if you work with cell lines, the composition of patients from whom the cell lines were derived, that there's e uh, equitable representation of different groups, um, there's no gender bias, uh, even mouse models, you know, to make sure that we use male and female mice in equal proportion when we, when we make these discoveries. Um, so there is realization, and, and I think because NIH is taking such a conscious role in this, I think it is going to have uh, a, a, a sea change in how scientists begin to appreciate the importance of this as well. Uh, it will take time, though, when we get to a point where there's the right kind of data for all people. So, Nitin, I'm mindful of the hour is uh, fast uh, passing uh, passing us, but um, I, I wanted to touch on the subject of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Again, these are terms that are used in various ways. Uh, we've recently, uh, through ASCO presentations, leveraged machine learning uh, to pull out certain phenotypes of uh, patients to form cohorts. For example, patients with metastatic disease across solid tumors or patients with good prognosis uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. Can, can you talk about your view of, of the current relevance and applications of AI to especially developmental therapeutics? The way you describe it, I think it can be used, hugely impactful if you are trying to find patients of certain characteristics that are likely to respond to a certain therapy and you um, recruit those patients to a study and then you, you show that there is a clear difference in response rates between patients with certain characteristics and those who don't have those characteristics. That's exactly the kind of biomarker stratified design that you would need uh, for eventually, eventually personalizing medicine. Now, where in, it may fall short is uh, when you say therapeutic discovery, it is fine for drugs that you know the mechanism of action for and that you associate with a certain signature that you empirically observed. But where it does not um, is not effective is when you're trying to find new drugs. So you find that there are patients who have different types of disease or subtypes of a given disease, but you don't know exactly why. Now, the, the lack of why is where you need to go beyond machine learning and AI. I think those approaches still, I think, are super powerful for certain kinds of problems. I would just caution the user that know clearly beforehand where there are shortcomings of this approach and where you need to progress towards causation and mechanism. And, and this, really, um, this really connects back to your comments uh, throughout our discussion relating to causality, correct? Yeah, exactly. I think, and, and the, the, that impacts how data are collected, um, how they're analyzed. And um, when I say how they're analyzed, I, I mean to say there's a wealth of knowledge that is already available for a variety of diseases. We can leverage that knowledge in a semi-supervised semi manner. So you can set up your machine learning and AI in a semi-supervised framework where you can take into account principles of biology and guide the algorithms into making new discoveries. The, on the other extreme, I mean, I've been saying ML and AI have some shortcomings. On the other extreme, you have what are called ex expert systems where you can constrain your discovery only to the knowledge that is already existing, meaning you have some representation of knowledge as a graph, and you try to fit parameters to that graph. This is the other extreme. You make no new discoveries, and it's been shown that it has got limited applicability. So you need to be somewhere in the middle where you use that knowledge and you use the power of discovery of big data and machine learning, and then you do semi-supervised discoveries of new insights. In some ways, it's to better contextualize uh, the findings through AI and machine learning. Uh, Sydney's reminding me to remind each of you to scroll down as you respond to the polling questions. Uh, there's a submit uh, button uh, 
at the very end of the scroll. Uh, Nitin, as, as we uh, wind up here, I want to end on a subject that, you know, you and I have known each other for a, a good a good while. And I know that aside from your scientific, your core scientific endeavors, as we've discussed today, you've been a champion for educating the next, next generation of scientists. And I, I wanted you to share with the audience a little bit about uh, the work that you and your colleagues have engaged with in uh, specifically at the high school level and engaging uh, students uh, developing their interest in science. Yeah, thanks for the question, Tom. This is something I deeply care about. Um, and, and you alluded to earlier and we discussed how science has changed dramatically. It's becoming, it's become cross-disciplinary. And unfortunately, it hasn't changed uh, the way the education system works. So we still train our young scientists uh, in silos. And you know, when I when I started my um, work here at ISP, I came to realize that there's this big global achievement gap that people talk about, which is people who are trained through high school, undergrad, and even grad school, when they come to the workforce, they're ill-prepared to take on real-world challenges. So they don't know how to solve problems. They have to unlearn and relearn everything all over again. And part of the reason is that they've been trained the wrong way. So you really need to learn science the way it is practiced. So in about 2003, I set up this program called Systems Education Experiences Program. Uh, with funding from the National Science Foundation. And in essence, what we did was we we figured out a way to accelerate the way knowledge is transferred from institutes like mine to the high school classroom. Typically, it takes five to 10 years or longer for knowledge to get transferred, but we accelerated it to a period of less than two years or one to two years. And the way we do that is by bringing in students and teachers to spend time at the institute over the summer and work with the scientists. And we leverage their experiences and knowledge to create curriculum modules that focus on science concepts and also authentic scientific practices. And we then take the modules, we pilot them in classrooms, we get feedback about what worked, what didn't work. We uh, iterate on that and we improve the, the modules, we align it to state and national standards then we do professional development of teachers, and then we disseminate the modules um, through training of teachers and also for, for free online. And we developed over a dozen different modules that focus on different systems biology concepts. Some states like California have adopted these curricula as official state mandated curriculum, and they're in use across all 50 states now. And uh, across over 100 countries worldwide. They've impacted millions of students. And so that, I think, is something that we take a lot of pride in, in being able to try to keep the education system uh, at pace with the progress that science is making, which is accelerating on a daily basis. Well, it's, it's a wonderful program and represents a mentorship at a a big scale relating to big data. I, Nitin, I, I know there are a bunch of questions in the chat room, but I wanted to highlight one before we end. Uh, and it's a, a nicely framed question. Correlation clearly isn't causation, yet the spurious examples cited have highly significant p-values. How does this apply to medical data? What are some ways to get around p-values in understanding the underlying mechanisms of biological processes? A very sophisticated question. Uh, and I, we only have uh, a matter of a minute or so to respond, but what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a very well-phrased question. Uh, the, the people say there's reality and then there's statistics, right? So there's, there's p-hacking that is well-known. So you have to really use the right statistical test when you analyze these large data sets. And there's a lot of considerations in terms of distribution of data, um, the size effect, um, and, and the likelihood of finding 
various correlations that go into selecting the right kind of testing. And as I said, multiple hypothesis testing is one thing that needs to be done. Selecting the appropriate statistical test based on data distribution, et cetera, is important. And at the end of the day, iterating back and testing your new insight is absolutely critical. So you can do that in a couple of different ways. One is using independent data sets that did not go into the training of the model. So they were cross-validation does not count. So you need independent data sets, uh, ideally from different sources generated by other people to validate. And the ultimate test in my view, I'm, I'm also an experimentalist, is to go into the laboratory and design an experiment to test your understanding. That takes a lot of effort, but when the stakes are this high, doing that experiment becomes absolutely critical when you are going to give a drug to a given to some patient. So in my view, there's many layers of due diligence that can address this issue. Um, and depending on the problem, you pick the right approach. Well, Nitin, that's a, in many ways a fine note to end on. Uh, that is uh, taking that discipline into the big data, real world data realm. I wanna thank you and I wanna thank our audience uh, for the terrific engagement. But uh, Nitin, it's always a pleasure and we so appreciate your insights. Thank you. Likewise, Tom, this was really enjoyable. Appreciate being here. Thank you both for being here today. That was a fantastic presentation and discussion. Thank you to the audience as well for participating. And last but not least, we'd like to thank the sponsor, PsyApps. In closing, we hope you enjoyed this webinar and we'll see you again next time.